Now that we've introduced and defined electric charge, let's introduce the notion of an electric field. An electric field is a property that exists in the space surrounding an electric charge, is represented by a vector, typically denoted by uppercase E, and at any given point represents the available electric force per unit charge. So let's go over that. Now here I have a point charge, Q, and I've drawn its electric field. We will go over this in detail in a separate video. Let's just agree for now that the electric field created by a positive point charge Q points away from that point charge. It's radially outward. And it looks something like this. And the vectors get shorter with distance because the magnitude of the electric field decreases with distance from the point charge. Again, we'll go over all of that in a separate video. But we have an electric field that has a specific direction, first of all, and that direction is the direction in which a positive test charge would experience a force if it were placed in that electric field. So first things first, test charge is just a charge with which you perform a test or an experiment. So let's say you have a positive test charge, Q test, and you place it right here where the electric field points, well, 45 degrees above the horizontal or something like that. Well, the direction of the electric field tells you the direction of the electric force that positive point charge is going to feel. Of course, if you have a negative test charge instead, then minus Q test, the direction of the force is going to be flipped. This actually makes sense because if you have a positive point charge here, Q, you know that a positive point charge Q will repel a positive test charge Q test, whereas it will attract a negative test charge minus Q test. So as far as direction goes, that makes sense. As far as magnitude goes, the electric field represents the available electric force per unit charge at any given point. And because of that, the units of the electric field are Newton per Coulomb. Now we'll show that it's equivalent to volt per meter later on, but for now let's just think of it that way. It's an amount of force per charge. In other words, if I have E is equal to 10 Newton per Coulomb at any given point, and my test charge, let's say the positive one, carries an amount of charge 0.2 Coulomb, which arguably is huge, but just let's just take simple numbers. Well, the amount of force that this test charge is going to experience is going to be Q test itself, the amount of charge that it carries, multiplied by the electric field E, because the electric field measures the available electric force per unit charge at any given point. So I get 10 Newton for every Coulomb, but if I have 0.2 Coulomb, that's going to be 0.2 times 10 is equal to 2 Newton. So it's not necessarily a very complicated quantity, as long as you remember that it's electric force per unit charge, and that you understand that the direction of the electric field gives you the direction in which a positive test charge would experience the electric force if it were placed in that electric field. What's tricky about an electric field is that you've never seen one and you probably never will. And therefore, it's very hard to relate this new quantity to anything you've experienced in everyday life. Unfortunately, in mechanics, it was very easy. I say unfortunately because you could imagine a cylinder rolling down an incline, and now you can't imagine an electric field. You don't really know what it looks like. So it's actually better to not try to tie this to any real life experience that you have or more likely don't have and just know the rules and know the definitions and we'll talk about right after this how you can represent an electric field with electric field lines and electric field lines have properties you should know those properties an electric field has a definition it's a force per charge at a given point and it has a magnitude and a direction and the best that you can do rather than try to relate it to everyday life, is just know the rules, know the rules to represent electric fields with electric field lines, and then use that to solve the problems. But the faster you decouple it from 
your everyday experience, the easier it typically is. I understand that's unfortunate. It's the biggest complaint students have about physics two in general, and particularly electric field, because that's always what we start with when we talk about physics two. But just the disclaimer for the entire course from here on out, a lot of these quantities are abstract and you don't have any real life experience with them. But we can still represent them. So now that we've talked about electric field a little bit, let's go over electric field lines. Now here again, I'm giving you the electric field of a positive point charge and a negative point charge. We're going to talk about this in detail, but for now let's accept that an electric charge plus Q, a point charge, has an electric field that points away from it. A negative charge minus Q has an electric field that points toward it. So one's radially outward, one is radially inward. Now, it's very convenient, in a sense, to draw the vector everywhere. It'll give you direction, and the relative length of each vector tells you that the magnitude decreases with the distance from the point charge, which is useful. The problem is it's rather tedious, because if you have to do that for every point charge that you encounter, it's going to take you forever, because you could also draw vectors here, and you could draw more than three, and so on and so forth. Therefore, rather than draw the vector plot of all these little vectors every time, we introduce the idea of an electric field line. And an electric field line is a line that's going to play connect the vectors, like this. And what you'll have for a positive charge Q is an electric field line directed away that connects all those vectors. And so if you generalize this, then you'll find that Overall, you can represent the electric field created by a positive point charge by drawing these field lines. Now, the upside is that it's a lot faster to represent the electric field that way. The downside is that you lose the information about the magnitude of the electric field. It no longer tells you that the magnitude decreases with the distance from the point charge because you can't tell the length of the individual vectors anymore. Now, that's unfortunate, but let's be realistic. Even though this tells you that E decreases with distance from the point charge, it doesn't actually tell you the value of the electric field. So it's nice, but it's not perfect. Therefore, we use electric field lines. And then what we do is we come up with a formula to compute the electric field at any point, at any distance R from the point charge, so that we have an easy way to represent direction and also a simple formula to compute the magnitude of the electric field at any given point. Now, of course, to finish this off, the same applies to the negative point charge. We just have an electric field that's directed toward the point charge. And we have these field lines that represent the vector, well, rather, the electric field in general, everywhere in the space surrounding this point charge. So something like this. And of course, you could draw as many as you want. We only usually draw a few. Sometimes we just draw one if you know the one that you want to focus on, and you don't have to draw the others. But this is a very simple way to represent the electric field created by, in this case, a point charge. But eventually, we'll get to the point where we can draw the electric field created by different charge distributions, such as an infinite line of charge or an infinite sheet of charge and so on and so forth. So it's very useful to have electric field lines. Now these electric field lines have properties. So let's go now to the following drawing, which is really the representation of an electric dipole. If you don't know what that is, that's okay. It's a positive point charge Q and negative point charge minus Q. So same charge and magnitude, just opposite in sign. And they're at a fixed distance from each other. That's an electric dipole. And here I've drawn the electric field lines associated with an electric dipole. And I did that so that we could go over, just with the drawing at first, the fundamental properties of electric field lines, and then we'll list them off so that you have them. But it's just easier to look at a drawing at first. Now, what we're saying here is that these lines represent the electric field everywhere in the space surrounding our electric dipole. What if 
you want to know the electric field, at least the direction of the electric field, at any given point. Well, the first property of electric field lines is that the electric field is tangent to the field line and in the direction of the field line at any point. So if you pick this point here, the electric field is going to be in that direction. I don't actually know if it's that long or longer or shorter. I'm not trying to scale my vector, but that is the direction of the electric field at that point. So it's pretty straightforward. Pick any point. As long as you know the field line, you draw a vector tangent to the field line in the direction of the field line, and that gives you the electric field at that point, at least in direction. Second property, none of these electric field lines intersect. And so for a given charge distribution, you cannot have electric field lines that intersect. And the reason is pretty simple. If at any given point the electric field is tangent to the electric field line, well, you can have two field lines that intersect. Because if you did, then at this point here, you no longer know the direction of the electric field. Is it going this way or is it going this way? Therefore, if you take a given charge distribution here, plus and minus q, and you draw the electric field lines, none of them should intersect. Right? Now, of course, if you were to bring in an additional charge, q0 here, and you started drawing the electric field lines of q0, you could draw electric field lines that intersect the electric field lines of your dipole. Fair enough. But if you were to consider the dipole plus q0, so everybody, and you were able, likely with a computer, to draw the electric field lines of those three charges, then none of them would intersect each other. So it's a matter of what you're drawing, but the idea is that if you're representing the electric field lines of a given charge distribution, they cannot intersect. Third property, electric field lines either originate at a positive charge and end at a negative charge. That's pretty straightforward. So electric fields go from positive charge to negative charge, from plus to minus, if you will. And we'll refine that later on, but for now, from plus to minus, that's fine. So two other options, though. You could have an electric field line that starts at a positive charge and goes all the way to infinity. It just doesn't stop. Or it could start at infinity and end on a negative charge like this one. So essentially, there are three options. Right? The most common one is that it starts at a positive charge, ends at a negative charge. But you could certainly have an electric field that either goes from a positive charge to infinity, the field line extends all the way to infinity, or the field line originates at infinity and ends at the negative charge. So those are the three options for field lines. And then the last two properties are pretty straightforward. In a region without any charge, the closer the field lines, the stronger the electric field. So for instance, here in this region, there is no electric charge. Where the field lines are closer, the electric field is stronger. And that's because you actually end up being closer to the negative charge. So it makes sense that you would feel a stronger electric field. Same thing here. No electric charge, but these field lines are far more spread out than these are. And so we can conclude that the electric field in this region is not as strong as the electric field in the region where the electric field lines are closer to each other. We can't say by what amount, not without more information anyway, but we can certainly say that the fact that they're more spread out, not as close to each other, means that the electric field is weaker in that region. And then finally, one last property, um, but we can't really see it on this, um, on this diagram. So I'll keep it for, um, for after we go over the first four and we write them out. But it has to do with the convention regarding how many electric field lines you draw if you have multiple charges that you're representing the electric field of. So let's just write these out real quick so that we have them. The first property is that E is tangent to the field line or the electric field line at any point in the direction of the field line. So it points in the direction of the field line. Two, field lines 
of a given distribution cannot intersect. Three field lines go from plus to minus go from a positive charge, call it plus Q, to infinity, or start at infinity and end at a negative charge, call it minus Q. And then four is that the closer the field lines the stronger the electric field E. And then finally, number five, as I mentioned earlier, has to do with how you draw the electric field lines to represent the magnitude of the charge in question. So let's just go over this. Here we have 2Q, the point charge. Here we have minus Q. And they're far enough from each other that they don't interfere with each other. So two Q's on its own and minus Q's on its own. I'm just drawing them side by side for comparison. Now, if I say that minus Q, which in magnitude is a charge Q, has four field lines, because I decide that four field lines corresponds to an amount of charge Q, then I'll draw an electric field like this. Now, if I want to show that 2Q has a magnitude of 2Q, meaning a double the amplitude, or the magnitude, rather, of the charge minus Q in charge, well, then I'm going to draw twice the number of electric field lines. So I would draw these four, but that number of field lines corresponds to an amount of charge Q, and I have 2Q, so I would draw another four to represent the fact that here in magnitude, I have double the amount of charge as the amount of charge that I have in magnitude on the right. Now, this is not used very often because it just gets tedious to choose the scale and then draw the proper number of electric field lines to show that you know one charge has, let's say, two or three times more charge than the other one and so on and so forth. So we typically don't really use this in practice. There are some problems where that's the whole point of the problem. So you need to know that this is a rule and that the more field lines we draw, well, the stronger the electric field because the more charge they represent in magnitude. Thanks for watching this video. At Congress Academy, we create custom study guides so that you don't have to. Send us your syllabus and some old exams and we'll put together lecture notes, practice problems with step-by-step -step solutions and classic exam questions so that you don't waste your time. All you have to do is log in and focus on studying what matters most. And if you have questions, we're available to help. If you'd like to learn more about how Congress Academy can help you do well, check us out at congressacademy.com. We look forward to helping you. See you there.